you all know who Sam is, as do many other people around the world. So a very big hand, please, for Sam Johnson. Thank you so much. And uh, there we go. Okay. It's been great, hasn't it? <laughs> this is why I live in Christchurch. This is why I get so excited about Christchurch. And today, you know, well, I guess the last two years have been the most absolute crazy time of mine, of anyone, of so many people's lives. It's been our team, the way that we've been able to, to help some people in Christchurch has been the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And I, I think it was summed up quite nicely recently. I was on a plane to San Francisco. Um, and, you know, I got on the plane and I sort of sat down and, you know, a lovely lamb curry arrived from a nice air hostess and I opened the little tin foil off the top of it and uh, got a glass of wine and a can of Sprite. And, uh, you know, when I'm a bit of a klutz and those who know me well know that my thought processes just sort of go off in a quite a tangent. And I, I cause my team at work uh, within the Volunteer Army Foundation uh, a lot of stress a lot of the time because I just have these new ideas and new things that I think are so easy. And, and they never have a problem with them either, but it's just like, oh, come on, slow down, Sam, a wee bit. But I, I, I'm a bit of a klutz, and so I just open the can ever so slightly, just, just you know, when you just crack the top of it. So it's, and, but you get a little bit out. And then sat down to eat, and I actually knocked the can onto the floor. And I hit the floor, spun around, and sprayed the four people sitting next to me. <laughs> and this guy from Horswell, he goes, I, I completely soaked. He's like, oh, you're the earthquake boy, aren't you? <laughs> I was like, oh. You know, what's a guy to do? 11 and a half hours to go. Here we are. <laughs> Hi, great. <laughs> nice to meet you, too. Oh. <laughs> Growing up, we're taught a lot about time. We're taught a lot about money. And we're taught a lot about skills and the importance of having skills and then what we do with our skills and where we go with our skills and, and what skills do you have. What I'd like to say today is actually what we should value in society more, and what we've seen in Christchurch that we should value more, is contribution regardless of your time, your money, or your skills. We saw a huge response from so many people after the earthquake. The 9,000 students and other um, community people who got out and about. And we see contribution right around the world in so many different ways, for good and for bad. The young people in London who rioted, they, that was their contribution. That was them fighting back from what it was a slow train wreck in their education system for years. And then the police who retaliated after that to capture it. And then the people who got out there afterwards and cleaned up the streets straight away. <laughs> I love this photo. And I think it, it, it encapsulates so much of Christchurch. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that from Christchurch, collectively, we, and I really mean the royal we, because although you know, I'm the, somewhat the poster boy for silt and liquefaction in Christchurch. <laughs> it was all of us. It was so much more than the student army, so much more than the farming army. It was us collectively, together, rebuilding our community, shoveling out this liquefaction, the silt that was created. <laughs> but what I love about the silt um, is that it, 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 there was just that community that bound around it. We did it because we, 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 it was something to do. It was everyone contributing. We were contributing in such such different ways, and there was the grassroots contribution, and then there was the what, people who built the container mall, and there's the people who contributed in so many hundreds and hundreds of different ways right throughout Christchurch that really made such a difference to the city and are making such a difference as we go, f go forward. I'll never forget, uh, straight after the earthquake, when I uh, rang up the, the, a certain call center in town and said, yeah, I'd really like to volunteer. I said, the poor, the poor woman on the phone, I sort of was like quite self-expectant, as I can be sometimes. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, what, what, you, know, you, know, you must be, have some path for volunteering. And uh, they said, well, what skills do you have to offer? Well, do you have any skills to offer? I said, well, I'm a student, right? We do couch burning and uh, uh, <laughs> all those lovely things. And, um, and it was just the language that was used that really grated me the most. And I think... Today, we've had so many people touch on this, that actually, it's just, as, as before, you know, oh, it should be no problem. 
Yeah, well, yeah, we should actually. And if we don't, let's create it. Let's make it. Let's actually do whatever we can to make it happen. Let's do what people want. One of my favorite stories about contribution from all the work in Christchurch was from these guys, from a school near Whangarei, uh, a low decile, one decile school in New Zealand, uh, decile one school, and they wanted to support Christchurch. And we had all these people who'd ring us up and say, well, you know, we can't give money. And there's so many organizations in Christchurch that will only accept money. But we want to give what we can give. And so the school, they raised $84 from money from the tooth fairy through to their pocket money to, to whatever they could scrounge out of the gutter in the street. They raised $84 for the student army in Christchurch. $84. And they bought muesli bars with, those, with that money. They then, each of them, they spent a whole day at school writing little notes. And they drew pictures on them. And they said, just keep going. Just do what you can. And so we had that, and we had people see 75,000 lunches arrived one day from Dunedin. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, you know, great. <laughs> and then one day we went out, and I had this, there was this bus that had just pulled up in the, in the car park at uni. And I was like, oh, some, somebody said, oh, Sam, I think you need to go and deal with the bus. <laughs> uh, and I went on, and you know, there was banana boxes of food on every single seat, two banana boxes, Stacked on every single street, seat, stacked long way. So one seat, two seat here. So four banana boxes in every single seat, filled with six different layers of baking and muffins and cakes and biscuits and whatever you could possibly imagine that had come from the Wellington region. And that had been people contributing. People just getting out there and saying, look, this is what I want to give. This is what we're going to give to Christchurch. And we just made sure we gave a box to every single student of that day and said, give it to someone who deserves it. Give it to someone and make their day. Make them smile. Make them have some fun. I spent two weeks with my colleague Jason in Japan following the tsunami. Speaking about Japan is actually not, it's really difficult. It was a horrendous time and it's something I never want to have to live through again, going there. The people there though were so incredible. They were so stoic, just like Cantabrians and they'd been through so much. And what really got me is that they apologized for the impact that their country and what's happened to them is having on the rest of the world. They apologize profoundly for causing such stress and such grief. This guy, Fujita Wakana, really got to me. He was the most incredible guy. He was standing at his door with his elderly mum when the earthquake hit. He said to his mum, look, mum, there's going to be a tsunami. He's about 55. It's going to be a tsunami. We need to get upstairs. We need to get away from this area. We need to get upstairs and away. And his mum said, no, no, we need to stay. We need to get all the rest of our family inside. And some of the family were congregating on the outside. And he said to, him, look, he said to his mum, can we break the window? And his mum wouldn't let him break the window to get them inside. And we know what it's like in Christchurch when you can't open the door after an earthquake, when you're stuck, when you're trapped, and you actually don't know what to do. You don't know where to go. You don't know what's going to hit next. This guy was standing at his door, and he, he looked out. And I want you to all imagine just looking out, maybe to the other side of the field uh, here where we are, and seeing a black wall of water hurtling towards you a couple of hundred kilometers an hour. And he ran. He, he, just, he, he ran across, and he, and he started to run up these stairs, and he's standing there just screaming, Mom, Mom, just come. Please, just come upstairs. Come upstairs. Just get away. Get away. It's coming. And Mom was elderly. She couldn't see it. She didn't know what was happening. She was just completely dazed. And he's running. He's screaming. And the, the waves are coming up. He runs up, and he, he, he stood on this table at the back of his, of his house for four or five hours. As this thing completely ravaged his entire life and his whole family. He, he then went, <laughs> he, he went back down um, eventually, and he was, he was yelling at some, some younger people he talked about as the younger generations, the 30, 40s, across the, across the street, who had also been in the upstairs of his house. And he said to them, Can we, we need to go and get water and go and get supplies and things. But none of them would leave their house. But this guy went out. He just went out and waist height, height water, waded through it, this black, oily, filled water of, with people and everything in it and got water and took it back to his little community. And then spent the next two weeks after the water had subsided to, to, to chest to sort of here and then down to ankle height, two weeks going around with this little bit of corrugated iron he had around his house, just piling on the bodies and stacking them up in his backyard. It was just incredible to talk to this guy though. He, he talked about it as, as, as if it was his destiny. He said, yeah, we've been through a really tough time, effectively. 
It's, it's, we live in a world that's full of disasters. We live in a place that we actually have these things happen to us every single day that we never know. We never know, we never know what's going to happen. We plan, but, but, but everything unexpected always happens, and we know that. We've experienced that in Christchurch. What we did in Japan, what Jason and I did in Japan, was on the broad scale, scale of things, was so insignificant. We went and we had a group of students from Waseda University. We went into, their, into these homes in and, and a soy sauce factory in particular, I remember. We just shoveled all the soy sauce, sort of filled muck and, and dirt and everything, into bags and put it out on the street. And just gave people back these, ho- these houses. And we went around and picked up uh, different artifacts from museums, whatever we possibly could. But we just made someone's life better. We just made them smile. We made them happy. We made them enjoy what they were doing and enjoy being, and just remember why we exist, why humans exist, is to interact with each other, I think, to actually spark off each other, and, and new ideas, and, and get excited, and bringing, the, I guess, the, that intergenerational mix into it, is something I'm so passionate about, and what I love so much, and what I think contribution, anyone's contribution, if you can go and speak to a, someone, someone of an older age, or you know, whatever it is, or someone of a younger age, what we learn from that is so strong, and something my grandparents taught me so much growing up. And I relate it back to the farming army and what they did. You know, we'd have these, these, bless them, lovely young ladies who would come out in their pretty white jeans and jandals to shovel the silt. Like, shovel ready, let's go. And, and, you know, they weren't the most productive shovelers, actually. <laughs> they did a great job. Uh, but mixing in with the farmers, it, just, it, was, it was just so, so awesome. But also things go wrong. You know, Japan, he taught me about hope. Fujita taught me about hope. The farmers, my grandparents have taught me a lot about intergenerational connection and what we need to do and how we can contribute in so many different ways to make a huge difference. But failure is big. And one of the things I can't get over in Christchurch is that actually we need to allow failure more. We need to allow people to fail. And my, my, me, myself, I've had, a mass, I've had a massive fail in the last couple of weeks. It's been a really tough couple of weeks. It's probably been my toughest couple of weeks since the earthquake just with what's happening with, with, our, with our project, with, what, with our team, everything. And, and me having some sort of expectation that my opinion, because it's my face on it, on the bill at the end of the day, is of a higher value than someone else's, when it's absolutely not. But it's so easy to get caught up in your own little world. But we've, that's why I think the strength of team, when you get brought back down to it, and you actually say, hey, Sam, we're all in this. We're all supporting you. And we're all going to make this happen. And it does happen. And it's really cool when it, when it, when it works. I think a lot about, I'm not, I'm not big on strategy, to be honest. <laughs> I don't like it. It's like, oh, that's, that's good. Let's go for it. Let's have a go. And I love this quote. You know, we just need to sometimes not think too much about things. Keep it simple. Keep it pure. And let's run with it. Let's see what we can do and, and go for it. Allow people to contribute. Whatever they want to give. A lot of people come to me now. I have a lot of different volunteers and things. to say, oh, no, what, what do you need help with? What do you need help with? And I say, no, that's the wrong question. What do you want to do? What do you want to help with? What are your skills? What can you, what can you contribute? Because everyone's got their thing that they love, and when we mix that in with what we're already doing and collaborate openly, I think it, you can get it. It's a really powerful mix. I take it back to this, this photo, and, uh, and that's because contribution for me, it's got to be fun. I don't do things that aren't fun. I like fun. We all like fun. And I remember asking uh, this, one of the farmers at the end of the day, at the end of the first days of the farming army when we worked together, I was like, uh, will you come back tomorrow? He's like, uh, young man, if you put those 10 young ladies with me, I'll come back every day for the rest of my life. (laughs) So, great. (laughs) We had to make it fun. You've got to make things fun. You've got to make them enjoyable. I mean, (laughs) you can get so worked up about the negative things in life. We can get so negative about the, the, the negative contributions people make. But for every negative contribution, I think we need to do 10 really positive things, and especially publicize and promote those, those things that are positive, those things that really make a huge difference. This year, our, what, I'm, what my sort of core purpose in life right now is about increasing contribution. How do we get the people in the world who would never normally contribute something to someone else, who would never actively go out of their way and just make someone smile? And it can be simple as, I guess, doing something a bit different. Just wearing red socks. I always wear red, red socks just for fun. And often it's just because you're like, well, we just do a bit, be a bit different. And you sit in a meeting and someone's like, well, you're wearing red socks. Especially if it's a really boring strategy meeting or something in Auckland. Like, oh, just, you know, let's, be not, let's not be so serious. Let's just ha- take ourselves not so seriously and have a bit of fun. Allow people to contribute with whatever they're going to do. So this year, we're putting on a big party. 
It's a big concert, but the only way to get a ticket to it is to do four hours of volunteering. You can do four hours of anything, so long as it contributes to someone else's life, so long as it makes it somewhat better. And then come and have a, have a great time with us. Come and be together in a place like this. Because I'm a big believer that actually we are all contributors in today. Being an audience member is such a huge contribution. I'd like to thank you guys all for showing up today. Because this is what really makes Christchurch for me, what makes it special. At the end of the day, contribution in Christchurch, contribution in any city, any town, whether they've been through a disaster or not, gives people a voice. It gives people a message. It gives people meaning. It helps them express themselves. There's a lot of talk in Christchurch about you know, how do we get young people involved? How do we get them involved? How do we get them involved with what we're doing? How do we get them involved in the rebuild of the city? How do we get a whole city involved in a rebuild of a city? There's no right or wrong answer. But for me, I get so excited about the fact that actually you can do anything in this place. You can go out and do something. You can make someone else's life better. You can make them smile. You can make them happy. And yes, it's only one of the little crazy creative things that are happening around this place. But for me, that's what makes the world go round. We shouldn't value time and money so highly, or skills. We just need to value people's contribution. And most importantly, we just need to make sure we don't stop them contributing. Just allow them to contribute in whatever way they possibly can. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much.